Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 43 of The Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of February 9th to the 15th, 2012. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next, oh, almost half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me and that I think deserve to be important to you as well. Uh, as always, any reactions to the show can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you can catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere a couple of times during the show. You can get the email address from there. Uh, and again, the only thing I ask is that if you do email me that you... Um, including the subject line, something like your show or left side of the aisle or something so that I know it's not spam. Now, this is another one of those weeks that, um, and I wish I had an hour because there's a whole lot of stuff I am simply not going to get to in order to get to the things I am going to get to. So I best get to it. Uh, first, as always, I like to, I uh, can start with some good news. On Tuesday, this is February 7th, a uh, three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals in California upheld a lower court ruling that found that California's infamous Proposition 8, or Prop 8 as it came to be known, uh, which banned same-sex marriages in the state, was unconstitutional, that it was a violation of the civil rights of gays and lesbians. Um, the court said, I'm going to quote this here, Although the Constitution permits communities to enact most laws they believe to be desirable, it requires that there at least be a legitimate reason for the passage of a law that treats different classes of people differently. There is no such reason that Proposition 8 could have been enacted. Now, the decision was a narrow one. It was, it was done, it only applies to California, not to any other place in the Ninth Circuit, and it was apparently based partly on the fact that same-sex marriages had been legal in California. This was not denying a right. This was taking away a right that had already existed. So the court said we do not and need not address the broader constitutional question of whether or not it can be constitutional to ban same-sex marriage. Now, the court stayed the effect of its ruling. Uh, uh, you know, that is, the, the ban continues for now uh, pending an appeal. And ultimately, this is likely to be heard by the Supreme Court. Now, the, um, the thing is that uh, even though it doesn't change anything in the short term, the fact is this is still a big victory. This is a major legal victory, which is why the right-wingers, of course, are all you know, apoplectic about it. Uh, here's, here's one reaction I really liked. David Raum, he's the senior counsel for the Alliance Defense Fund. This is a fundy outfit that... Um, a funny legal outfit. He pulled out all the stops. He went around pushing buttons like a deranged monkey with a cell phone. Uh, he referred to this as Hollywood orchestrated attack on marriage tried in San Francisco. Ooh, scary. Um, I mean, that's just how... Oh, by the way, speaking of deranged right-wingers, that brings us to uh, Rick, I should be in a sanitarium. He told a gay man at a campaign stop recently that that man had no right to be married uh, because um, same-sex relationships don't bring the benefit to society that opposite-sex relationships do. He said marriage is an intrinsic good and we allow people that privilege in order to encourage that behavior. So here's my, uh, my question to Ricky Boy. Um, what benefit is it that an opposite-sex marriage brings to society that a same-sex marriage doesn't. Uh, a loving relationship, stable home, nurturing environment, that seems to be the same in all cases. Uh, bearing children, ah, there it is, that's what it is. This has to do with procreation. That's the idea of marriage, is for procreation. All right, what about you've got a man and a woman who want to get married, but they're too old to have kids? Are you going to say they can't get married because there's no benefit to society? What about a young couple that wants to get married and decides they don't want to have children? Can they not get married? I mean, the extent of your logic, when you push it like this, the logic comes out to you're not really married until after you have children, which kind of means all children are now bastards, but that's the kind of thought 
lack of thought process these people go through. All right, well, moving on from there to the other bit of good news. Karen Handel, the former vice president for public affairs at the Susan G. Komen for the Cure, resigned on Tuesday after a public outcry uh, resulting from the organization's decision to pull its funding of Planned Parenthood. Handel was the one who really pushed this decision. Uh, and the uh, decision, by the way, as you probably know, was, was reversed in just three days after that public outcry. Now, after the decision was reversed and when this business about Handel first came out, um, there were a lot of demands for her to resign. And initially I said, no, no, let, let it go. I mean, you've, the decision is reversed. You won your case. You know, why make more out of this than necessary? But based on what's come out since then, oh yeah, she needed to go, and I'm really glad she got the push. Uh, for one thing, it turns out that before she was with the Susan G. Komen Foundation, uh, Handel ran for governor of Georgia uh, in 2010, and part of her platform was a pledge to defund Planned Parenthood. After she lost the Republican primary in August of 2010, she was hired by, by Susan G. Komen for the cure in uh, April of 2011, and she started pushing for defunding Planned Parenthood from the minute she walked in the door. In fact, according to emails furnished to journalists, she was the one who came up with the idea of using a change in eligibility to ban groups who were under investigation from getting any, uh, getting any um, funding. And actually, in one email said, if we say it's about investigations, we can defund Planned Parenthood and no one can accuse us of being political. Uh, it turns out they could because you were. And it also means that claims by the foundation itself that this was a routine change in their criteria and it was only done for the benefit of women, those claims are damn lies. Uh, so Handel is out and good riddance and the Susan G. Komen Foundation now has to rebuild its reputation. Oh, one last thing though, next to last thing. Uh, before Handel left, she made sure, as the whining crybabies of the right invariably do, she made sure to claim that she was the victim here. That it was all those other people who made this political and she just, like, sniffle. She was just trying to do the best she could for women and, and her, her right-wing fanaticism about abortion had nothing to do with this. Yeah, right. By the way, as a footnote to this, just so you know the figures, um, only 3% of Planned Parenthood services and only 15% of its revenue comes from abortion-related services. 97% of services, 85% of revenue are unrelated to that. And by the way, you may have heard another lie about Planned Parenthood, the one that said last year that Planned Parenthood lied about providing mammograms. Well, first off, no. What happened was a, uh, the director of Planned Parenthood was talking in general terms about the health services that women need and mentioned mammograms in that list. Plus the fact a couple of Planned Parenthood clinics actually do provide mammograms. All right, we're moving on from there. Uh, from the good news to the bad news. Uh, this is the outrage of the week. Now, I expect you know that the CIA has been using drones, or they're called, actually called RPVs, remote, remotely piloted vehicles. Uh, they've been using drones to attack targets in um, Pakistan. This started under the Bush administration in 2004. What you may not know is that the use of these drones has escalated dramatically under the Obama administration. Since Obama came into office, there have been 260 such attacks in Pakistan. That's an average of about one every four days. Now, Obama insists that there's no real civilian casualties caused by this. He said, and I'm quoting here, he said this at a recent uh, online forum, this is a targeted, focused effort at people who are on a list of active terrorists trying to go in and harm America. That is a lie. On February 4th, the Bureau of, in of Investigative Journalism this is a noted outfit in the United Kingdom. They released study, uh, the results of a three-month study that was commissioned by the Sunday Times. This is the Times that's published in England, in London. They found that since Obama took office three years ago, upwards of 550 civilians have been credibly reported in the media as being killed, including over 60 children. More shocking than that, the investigations, including eyewitness accounts, 
show that there's evidence that more than 50 civilians were killed in follow-up strikes when they'd gone to help the victims. That is, a drone strike hit a place, people went to aid the victims, and they got bombed. The report says, and I'm quoting, between May 2009 and June 2011, at least 15 attacks on rescuers were reported by credible news media, including the New York Times, CNN, the Associated Press, ABC News, and Al Jazeera. Civilians have also been attacked in deliberate strikes on funerals. In one case, it was documented in the report, a mid-level Taliban commander was killed by a drone strike for the specific purpose of enabling a strike on the funeral. 83 people were killed in that latter strike, up to 45 of them civilians, 10 of them children. And there's something that really needs to be mentioned here. Uh, this investigation used a very conservative methodology. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism said they would only count someone as a civilian if they felt they could clearly show that that person actually was a non-combatant. What that means is the actual number of civilian deaths is almost certainly considerably higher. And these actions almost certainly are war crimes. In fact, uh, one aid worker referred to the attacks on the rescuers as being like attacking the Red Cross. The next day, the New York Times, after the day after the report was released, the New York Times had an article about the report that included this paragraph. I'm quoting the paragraph here. A senior American counterterrorism official, speaking on the condition of anonymity, questioned the report's findings, saying, targeting decisions are the product of intensive intelligence collection and observation. The official added, one must wonder why an effort that is so carefully gone after terrorists who plot to kill civilians has been subjected to so much misinformation. Let's be under no illusions. There are a number of elements who would like nothing more than to belign these efforts and help al-Qaeda succeed. So what we have here with this is presidential lies about a program that has killed hundreds of civilians, including targeting refu uh, rescuers and funerals. But if you tell people about that, the New York Times will actively abet some unnamed senior official scuttling like a coward behind a wall of anonymity and smearing you with innuendo that your real intent is to aid al-Qaeda. I'm not sure which part of that is the most outrageous, to tell you the truth, but the fact is, whichever it is, it surely is the outrage of the week. And we'll be back after a quick break. And here we are, and there you are. So, uh, next thing is um, more sad news, more bad news. Uh, the drums of war are being beaten again about Iran. And the funny thing is about, about uh, seeing what's going on, reading what's going on, is that the people beating the drums haven't even bothered to actually change the script from the war in Iraq. It's all about looming threats, imminent dangers that are forever coming but never quite arrive. In fact, now, most recently, it's back to claims of links to al-Qaeda, claims of huge arms buildups, and comparisons of the country's leaders, Saddam Hussein then, Mahmoud of Ahmadinejad now, to Hitler. And it's, it's all nonsense. All right, well, I got to amend that. Not all of it. Um, I forget who it was that said that a lie is most effective when it's wrapped around a kernel of truth. The kernel of truth here, uh, Ahmadinejad did say that Iran is going to increase its military budget next year. He said by 127 percent, which is unlikely considering Iran's uh, economic condition. But never mind, just take it at face value. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, Iran's total annual military spending is $7 billion. An increase of 127% is $15.8 billion. The Defense News has a rather higher figure. They say it's now $12 billion, and so an increase of 127% brings it to $27.2 billion. So take the higher figure there, the $27.2 billion, and you have a figure that is equal to no more than 4% of the U.S. military budget. The kernel of truth is that Iran has announced plans to increase its military spending. Um, the, uh, the, the, the lie is that this isn't in any way threatening to us. 
But the big deal with Iran is, as it has been, is claims about a supposed drive to get nuclear weapons. I think, I think it's, even this is not new. Before the 1991 Gulf War, one of the driving things behind it, one of the things that was put out to try to generate support for it, was a claim that Saddam Hussein was going to get the bomb. Well, that kind of drifted away in the case of Iraq, but in the case of Iran, it's remained central to the entire hysteria generating machine. In fact, it is, this is supposed to be such a huge threat that there's increasing talk about the necessity of direct military attacks on Iran to prevent this. Just last week, the Israeli defense minister, his name is uh, Ayud Barak, said that uh, the world is increasingly ready to consider such an attack if economic sanctions don't force Iran to comply with the demands. That is, if they don't force Iran, basically just shut up and do what they're told. I consider just just some recent talk about I mean, this goes back. I mean, in March of 2009, the Obama administration was claiming that Iran already had enough material to build a nuclear weapon. So this is again, this is not new. So it's kind of just recent stuff about this. Last fall, there was, a, there was a lot of hype about a new UN report from the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA which, according to these uh, media reports, strongly asserted Iran is close to building a nuclear weapon. USA Today, ABC World News, The Today Show, The AP, Time Magazine said this. There are editorials in The New York Times and The Washington Post about this. Uh, they, they were agreeing that Iran was, as one put it, on the brink of nuclear weapons. In December, the American Enterprise Institute said Iran will have a nuclear weapon before next January before the next inauguration. And just last week, Israeli officials asserted that Iran already has produced enough fissionable material for at least four nuclear weapons. And the media, our media has, has bought into this wholeheartedly. In fact, so much so, the Washington Post, on its online version, has a photo gallery that goes along with any story about Iran. The title of that photo gallery was Iran's Quest to Possess Nuclear Weapons. And again, this is not new, but just look at some recent examples of how the media has been treating this. On December 19th, CBS Evening News quoted uh, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta as saying Iran could have a bomb within a year, maybe less. Less than a week later, in January 25th, in an interview with Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, Ann Curry, a host on the Today Show, said, and quoting, everybody believes, unquote, Iran is trying to build nuclear weapons. In early January of this year, the New York Times casually referred twice in one day to Iran's nuclear weapons program. The thing is, there's a real problem with the, uh, with the Iranian nuclear weapons program. There isn't one. Mossad, this is the Israeli intelligence service. Mossad has an intelligence assessment that Iran has not decided whether or not to start a military program to construct a nuclear warhead. That is, right now, there is no Iranian nuclear weapons program. Uh, that's the same conclusion that uh, the, the uh, consensus conclusion of the 16 U.S. intelligence agencies. They concluded this in 2007 and again in 2010. Last March, in March of 2011, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, his name is James Clapper, he told the Senate Armed Services Committee that Iran is keeping open the option of developing nuclear weapons, but we have no idea whether or not they'll ever do it. Again, to put it more bluntly, right now, Iran is not trying to build a bomb. What's more, there are CIA drone flights over Iran that have found no evidence of the kind of secret nuclear facilities Iran would need to be pulling this off. And the thing is, this not building a bomb notion is also consistent with what the Iranian government itself says. But God forbid we should believe them, even though what they say is consistent with all the knowledge that we have. In fact, this whole Iranian nuke uh, meme collapses as soon as anybody pushes on it. In fact, remember that quote from Leon Panetta I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, the one where Iran could have a bomb in less than a year? In the same interview, he said there's no indication that a decision has been made to even try to build a nuclear weapon. And the next day, an aide repeated it to reinforce that. 
The case is weak enough that uh, the Washington Post recently changed that heading on that photo gallery from Iran's quest to possess nuclear weapons to Iran's quest to possess nuclear technology. All right. But what about that IAEA report from last fall? The one that media record, according to media accounts, said that Iran was on the brink of having nuclear weapons. Well, in fact, the rhetoric about that report wildly exaggerated the actual case it made and the actual claims it contained. First off, the IAEA still uh, inspects Iranian nuclear facilities, and it says, and it's consistently said, there's no evidence of any diversion of any of that material from a civilian to a military purpose. But in regards to this, this um, uh, report, the entire media focus was on an annex to the report that laid out the evidence for a potential military application based on getting nuclear power technology, which frankly could be said of almost any nuclear power program. Um, did, by the way, did you know that the Eisenhower administration pushed the development of a nuclear power industry in the United States for the specific purpose of having enough material to build our nuclear weapons program? All right, but, but, all right, but getting back to Iran, most of the annex, this, this annex that had the, the media in such a tizzy, was about past activities. Very little of it referred to anything that could be considered present. The report does not say Iran has a bomb. It does not say it's building a bomb. It does not say it's trying to build a bomb. It says only that its work on nuclear technology could be consistent with building a bomb, which again could be said of any reasonably sophisticated nuclear power program. You can't build nuclear power without having the possibility of at least some crude nuclear weapons. Despite all that, the media still, still, still routinely refers to Iran's nuclear weapons program. Even so, perhaps the, the, uh, uh, the drum thumpers are, um, are aware of the weakness of that part of the argument because they've, uh, the Bombs Away gang has opened up a new front, one which also harks back to Iraq. They're coming to get us. The end of January, there was another spate of fear-mongering reports. These drew on the testimony of James Clapper before the Senate on January 31st. The breathless accounts of that testimony, uh, which included the obligatory references to Iran's saber-rattling, described Clapper as saying Iran is willing, willing and more determined than ever to launch a terrorist strike inside the United States. The boogeyman is coming. Add to that the claim by Israeli officials just last week that Iran is building a missile that could reach the United States and it's, oh my God, the boogeyman's here. The evidence for this terrorist attack is really pretty thin gruel. Clapper even had to resort to reports of Iran uh, working with Hezbollah cells in the Western Hemisphere, even though the State Department says no such cells exist. All right, but that's not the point here, not the point I want to make. Think, these people know what they're doing, okay? What Clapper actually said was that Iran was prepared to retaliate, including with a possible terrorist attack, if it was attacked. That's what he said, but he knew damn well how it would be reported. But, I mean, come on now, let's be real. Why should Iran feel threatened? I mean, let's just, let's just look how secure Iran is. Okay, we're going to bring up a graphic here. The area in the center, which I've sort of outlined in green, because uh, it's not a very good map, but the area in the center is Iran. The red nations are bordering nations where the U.S. has military bases. The stars are U.S. military bases. Now, why would Iran feel threatened? It's as snug as a bug in a rug. So why should they be worried? Why should they be worried? Just because the Obama administration cranked up the level of sanctions for the specific purpose of trying to wreck Iran's economy. Why should they be concerned just because of repeated references to a nuclear weapons program which doesn't exist? Why should they be concerned just because of intensifying reports of an Israeli strike on Iran sometime in the next couple of months? Why should they feel threatened? 
And there's one last thing here, something else these people have learned well since Vietnam. You don't launch a true surprise attack. What you do is raise the possibility of such an attack so many times, so often over such a period that when it actually happens, the reaction is muted because it's not a shock. It's just what you've come to expect. All right, we're going to wrap up with something a little bit lighter. Hey, we got to do this. Uh, and another thing, our occasional foray into things not, um, not political. This week uh, includes Valentine's Day, the week of this show. So the question is just who was St. Valentine and how did he come to be associated with a day of love and romance? We don't know. In fact, not even sure where St. Valentine was. There are legends about it. There's three different Valentines who are recognized uh, as saints by the Roman Catholic Church. And it's all surrounded by legend. One legend has this uh, St. Valentine being executed by Claudius II, Emperor of Rome, uh, because he tried to convert Claudius to Christianity. Another says that Claudius executed him because he defied a ban on marrying people, because Claudius said men should remain single the better to be soldiers. A third one says that while he was in prison awaiting execution, he fell in love with the jailer's daughter and sent her a note saying, from your Valentine. So the truth is, I mean, so much of what is known about this is legend that um, it's as mysterious as love is. What we can say is like many modern observances, uh, Valentine's Day, the way we observe it, has some pagan roots. February 15th, the Ides of March, was Lupercalia. That was a Roman fertility festival. Uh, the day involved rituals meant to include increase the fruitfulness of the fields and the women. According to legend, later in that day, the women of the town, single women, will put their names into a pot. The bachelors will take out the name and be matched to that woman for the next year. And a lot of marriages re revolved around this. Uh, and one of the ideas is that February 14th was set up as a feast day in the church to Christianize Lupercalia, which ultimately got banned outright at the end of the 5th century. But like a lot of such occasions, um, some sense of the old traditions involving fertility, mating, and marriage clung to the new day. But it wasn't until the high Middle Ages, 1,000 to 1,300, when we started to get real connection between um, uh, romance and the day. Uh, it's been celebrated since the 1400s. Uh, it became popular in England around the 17th century and in America in the early 18th century. And in 1840, came the first mass-produced, hand-printed Valentine's cards, and now there are millions. So that's Valentine's Day, and if your birthday happens to be Valentine's Day, let me wish you a happy birthday with much love and much gratitude as well. Uh, for all of you out there, you just have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. Have a great week.